Okay, um, so welcome to this guided meditation session presented by the Contemplative Study Center at the University of Melbourne. We respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land in which many of us are currently residing, and we pay our respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. We're delighted to welcome Jess Guan. Um, Jess teaches for Melbourne Insight Meditation, um, which is a community of meditators practicing in the tradition of insight, or otherwise known as Vipassana meditation, which emphasizes direct experience through the practice of meditation. The practice is based on early Buddhist meditation techniques and some of the oldest surviving texts, which are practiced without purporting any beliefs, rather offering an invitation to inquire with intimacy into life here and now. As a volunteer-based not-for-profit organization, the MIM, aim to build and strengthen the community, supporting each other and establishing and deepening their practice. They offer a program of weekly meditation sits, events, and a growing community interested in exploring the contemporary application of authentic Buddhist teachings in their lives. Jess is an authorized Dharma teacher who is trained in Buddhist monastic settings, interfaith contexts, and extended periods of solitary forest practice. Whilst deeply informed, but not bound by tradition, her style is grounded in contemporary life. If you have any questions about MIM or the practice today, please place those in the chat and um, Jess will address as many of those as she possibly can towards the end of the session. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jess who will give you a bit of background uh, and we'll then move into some practice. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, it's always slightly strange for me not being able to see everybody's faces, but I can see your names. So um, yeah, thank you, Nicholas, for that introduction. And a very warm welcome from me to this six week sessions of meditation classes. And I really hope that this is a, a resource for you in these you know, fairly demanding times. I think most people here are in Melbourne and we've had the most extensive uh, lockdown here in the world, um, not to mention you know, everything else that we're facing as a human species now. But uh, yeah, so really, so this will, this, these classes will go for six weeks and you're really welcome to dip into them as you like. Uh, each one will be self-contained, uh, but I will try to have some uh, sense of sequencing as we go through some of the, the practices over the six weeks. And also I was thinking I'd really like just to give a bit of context for the, the practice that we'll be doing uh, before I sort of invite us into the experiential practice. And I was thinking for this first time, um, that might be a little bit more detailed, just so you get a sense of who you're practicing with, just a little bit about myself and also this tradition. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so Nicholas was, was, did that lovely introduction to Melbourne Insight Meditation Group. And this is the group that I sort of, they're kind of my home base that I teach with mostly, but I also teach independently, uh, where independently where I will offer teachings, which are a little bit more wider in scope than just that tradition. But as I said, that tradition really is my home base. And I've been sort of reflecting on the, the sort of essence of this contemporary, we'd say Buddhist tradition and yeah, I've been sort of musing on this and I was really thinking that, that what it really is, it's reflective of this conversation of the East and West and all of those people, men and women, who sort of in the 60s, 70s kind of dropped out of universities, you know, the time of the Vietnam War and really burning questions around what is it to, to live a, a meaningful life? What is it to really mature as a human being in, in heart and mind and went on this hippie trail, you know, and went to, to India and went to Thailand, went to Burma and started diving into these Buddhist teachings. And uh, really began to sort of come in contact with this pretty astonishing body and map and I'd say a pretty astonishing inheritance of, of, of knowledge uh, and inquiry into the human heart and mind. And, and some of you will be familiar with some of these people and some of you won't, but probably many of you have heard of, you know, Jack Cornfield and Tara Brack, Sharon Salzberg, they're more the American crew who came back and then really integrated this, this knowledge, this insight, this inquiry 
into psychotherapy, into psychology, and have really had you know significant contributions. I think into sort of modern culture and and, and health and wellness um, and just into the mind. And so a little bit different, like how this tradition landed in Australia was was more through an interestingly English man called Christopher Titmus. And and I met Christopher when I was a late teenager and I myself just went to India. I remember sitting in front of him cross-legged and very beautiful man who stayed very true to his ethics and his teachings, lived his whole life on donation, has got a real political fire. Um, yeah, stayed very true to his words. So he kind of brought these teachings to Australia and then there was a, a student body that kind of began to learn with him and they're my senior teachers and they're the senior teachers of Melbourne Insight. And maybe some of you would have known the, the Buddhist scholar, we're sometimes called Pundit in the Buddhist language, um, Patrick Kearney, you know, real brightness in his eye, very cheeky man, but, but very deep knowledge. And also Carol Perry, who was a pretty, uh, uh, very feisty woman, an activist, did a lot of mediation in war zones, um, also a psychotherapist. So these sort of teachers, these people really haven't withdrawn from life, but are really deeply engaged and, and bringing this inquiry uh, really into the relational sort of realm. So I think that's pretty cool. So I think, you know, we're in a good tradition here. Uh, yeah. And so I think we've all kind of, all of us really, you know, knowingly or unknowingly, a part of this conversation between the East and the West. I mean, we see this image of the Buddha kind of everywhere. You know, we can, we can see the Buddha in nurseries. We can see the Buddha just in posters on the street. It sort of had some impact, you know. I remember going into a, a nightclub in New York and seeing an image of the Buddha, you know, radiating from the side. Um, you know, and we've also been hearing this word mindfulness, which has really become a buzzword in, in wellness circles. So I, I find this really interesting. Mm, and so, yeah, so I think we all come to meditation for very different reasons and, you know, welcoming you all here for whatever motivation might have brought you here. I know just a little bit about myself and then we're going to dive in, but, but I remember being a teenager and, and, and you know, I think we all go through sort of metamorphic crises as teenagers, but I remember really at some point become very aware of this fact that, oh my gosh, I'm going to be living in this body, heart and mind for the rest of my life. I never know when that's going to stop, um, but I am really here in relationship with my own mind and my own body. So I might as well learn to settle in, you know, and, you know, I was also sort of struck watching people around me and how people were relating with pain and relating with suffering. So I, I was seeing a lot of the, the running, also seeing that in myself and, you know, people wanting to sort of get out of it. Somehow we could get away from it. And I really thought, you know, there must be another way to, to, to relate, you know, with our own experience that could be really fruitful, which where we could be more um, still, less frightened of everything that we feel as a human being. So that sort of set me off to, to India. Uh, yeah, and I think we can all, I think when we really ask ourselves some of these deeper questions and we do kind of feel the impermanence of our own life, we can sort of think, how do I want to live? Um, you know, and we know that we're only here for this short time, you know, looking out of these eyes and touching with these hands, um, we can sort of, we can think, yeah, I, I would like to live a meaningful life. You know, I'd, li I'd like to live a life that is congruent with my own values, um, you know, with, with the way that I really see, with what I really care about. Um, you know, and, and I would like, I think for many of us, we would like to be happy, you know, we want to be well, we want to function well in our relationships. But I think we can also know that that's not always easy. You know, like, and you know, particularly for many of us here that work closely with other people when they're in periods of distress and also, you know, understanding what we each go through as a human being, our, our habits are tenacious. You know, habits in the mind can really die hard and it takes quite, quite a lot of resource and awareness and support to be able to keep seeing through and living deeper than, than, than patterns which wind us up and provoke pain. 
So you'll sometimes hear this word meditation practice, and it's sometimes articulated as a sadhana, which really means where we're, we're having some kind of method, some sort of method of practice to get behind what we really care about. Um, and so that's what I think a meditation practice in some way offers. It's sort of the, the incubator and the method to start to become more embodied and congruent with what we care about and that we need support for that. Uh, because, you know, the heat can, can get really strong internally and it's definitely strong externally at the moment. Mm. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I mentioned as a teenager that I went to, to India and that I began to become uh, familiar with this very intricate map that the Buddha put forward. You know, and then I was also, you know, studying a lot actually at Melbourne University for quite a period, VCA at Melbourne University. And then I was taking off to India and practicing in the monasteries for really lengthy periods, and sort of somehow trying to integrate these very sort of different lives. Uh, mm. And so, but I came in contact with this map. And just to give you a little bit more context before we dive in, because I think context is so important um, here just to begin with. Because very what, what we'll sort of see now is aspects of, of, of the Buddhist map have been kind of taken out and used for a agenda in different agendas that weren't always intended. Because what the Buddha put forward was pretty radical in what's possible for us to experience as a human being. You know, the 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 maturation of the heart and being able to live with a real empathic resonance uh, and yeah, so, so in that, if we put it really simply, um, yeah, yeah, his map, you know, we, which it, it, we could say it's sort of divided into three aspects. And so the first would be uh, ethics. You know, there's an ethical orientation that I am sort of inquiring in how I can live in a way that uh, doesn't further cement suffering. Um, you know, in relationship to my own mind, you know, how can I relate with myself that doesn't sort of perpetuate these cycles of suffering, pain, or the further enactment even of sort of trauma? You know, how can I intercede that? How can I do something differently? And um, so this ethical, ethical sort of component, our intention for practice, and, and also, of course, that, you know, that, that some willingness to be able to, in time, feel more the subjectivity of others, include others, sort of in the field of our care. So there's this ethical component and then there's this meditation component, which really where some of the, the, the skill and the discipline is needed in, in how, how do I sell my mind? How do I know a, a deeper reference point than the kind of tumult that can move through or the sort of addictive patterns of thinking the discursive thought, that anxiety that can drive the mind. How can I actually rest deeper than, than agitation and stress? So, so we need to settle down and start to be able to see with more space. And this is the meditation realm to have some deeper grounding. And then the, the third component is this insight. This insight in through settling the mind, we can start to really see in a way that can unknot these deep patterns of suffering and stress. We can, when we think of insight, I think of this word that anything that loosens the grip of suffering and brings freshness and creativity back into the mind. So, so anything that loosens the grip of suffering, that, that loosens the knots, you know, insight, penetrating insight. We sort of hear this term in the in the Buddhist teachings. Mm. So yeah so that's just a little bit put forward there and and we will we'll, we will just now just about to dive into the practice but also that the essence the beginning of that path which i think is some of the heart of the teachings what the buddha puts forward is that there is something in us there is something in us that, that whatever we experience and however difficult it can get and however much the patterns of mind can get really say cemented and take us down some dark roads sometimes you know or even just tricky roads or uh, that, that, that there is a deeper place in us that can outshine our constraint that there's something in us which can look upon that which moves through us 
Um, and that, that that's a sort of deep view that there is a deeper resourcefulness in us, that there is, you could say, you know, poetic word, a wellspring in us as a human being that we can come into contact with through sitting down quietly and becoming intimate with our own experience. But again, all of these teachings are just put forward for us to uh, really then inquire for ourselves, to test out ourselves. You know, and that's what I was always kind of doing, you know, really, is that true? Do we have this? Um, yeah. So the practice that we'll be doing uh, today, although it's going to be a very simple meditation where we will be doing a little bit of a, a body scan through the body. So all these practices that are offered, the meditation practices are really centered in the body. We can see that the, that the body is alive in the here and now. The body's you know, right here, whereas the mind, you know, the mind, the beautiful mind, I mean, I love thinking, you know, I love the mind. So there's you know, no, no denigration of the mind as an inquiry, the intellect. Um, I have a, a deep regard for the intellect. But the mind can very quickly move to the past and to the future. It can fabricate. It moves like lightning. You know, it can take us right out of this moment. So, so the body really helps us sort of be here. So we have to be here to start to see what's happening clearly. So we'll be settling the mind. We'll be using the, the breath as the object of our awareness and just learning to have a sort of relationship with the breath that helps us uh, yeah, rest deeper and to not be so hooked in with thought. You know, and this takes a bit of time. So I invite you just to take a sitting posture. So take a sitting posture. I think we're in pretty good timing. And just paying a little bit of a, attention to your posture. So, you know, you might like to close your eyes. And just to let yourself arrive here into this moment. Yeah, everybody has probably been pretty busy just before arriving here. So you just kind of, could you just sort of notice uh, the sensations of where your body meets the ground in a really simple way, just feeling, you know, where your sit bones, where your thighs, where your calves or where your feet meet the ground. To bringing a mindfulness to the to the lower body, the sensitivity to the lower body. A human being just sitting close to the ground where it's getting very simple here now. And then if you could just have a sense of your spine, a sense of a gentle uprightness in the spine, you know, without being militant. A lot of the habits in the mind will also uh, be seen as habits in the body, this relationship with mind and body. So just lengthening the spine into a gentle uprightness. There's a kind of quality of quiet dignity in an upright spine. And then just relaxing the shoulders if you can. Can you soften the shoulders? And softening your face. And, and just before we begin, the, the, that sort of ethics that's at that beginning of the, the path is also very much around the relationship with our own inner life. So the encouragement is this friendliness with our own mind. You know? We can be very harsh with our own mind, all of us. So there's this genuine willingness as we practice, that there's the invitation to bring this quality of friendliness to our own mind, knowing our own mind is sometimes really going to be uh, 
under duress, you know, and needs care. Particularly if we're switched on to everything that's going on, you know, it's that that we sort of sometimes are agitated is you know, I think it's a healthy sign. But yeah, but then how do we be with this? So friendliness to the mind. And just settling into the whole of your body, just seeing there, we just that, that light scan, just again feeling the feet. Again in the calves, and just relaxing the body, relaxing your thighs. You know, whenever we're anxious, our attention usually moves upward into the into the head, and we lose this global awareness of our body. Just feeling your thighs and again, feeling your sit bones, your spine. Again, just relaxing your arms. And then the invitation to, could you orientate your awareness to your breath? You know, and giving a lot of room if your mind has been busy or if you have been agitated or, you know, which is very common in lockdown, if there has been any anxiety, just to give that a lot of room. But could you start to just see if you could place your mind on your breath? And just the simple breath, just the simple inhale and exhale. And just checking in, some people feel the breath most easily in different places and, and people will, will teach this differently, but just to see, do you feel your breath most easily in your nostrils? or your chest, or your belly. And just seeing if you could choose one place and just let your attention rest there. Here we're just noticing and, and feeling the inhale And the exhale. Let's see if you can really stay with this, just staying in contact with your body. And in staying in, in contact with your breath and the nature of the mind is to move and the, and the thoughts do often like to be in the driving seat we can sometimes have a sort of addiction to thought so so a lot of patience just noticing when the mind kicks in and just coming back to a resting place with the breath and just inhaling and exhaling And just letting the whole system settle, just have a pause. And sometimes when we stop, we also actually notice more agitation because we're more sensitive and that's really okay. 
And stopping like this gives it time to unwind. So, you know, in the, what's put forward in these teachings is that all we experience is very workable. So we're just inhaling and exhaling. It's really calming the body and the mind with the breath. So in, in a sense, it's like settling under the, the turbulence at the top of the ocean into the deeper waters, but it takes time. You might like to just notice what your eyes are doing. If there's a lot of thinking, the eyes will tend to shoot upward. So you could just gently, very gently, just lower your eyes downward, which helps with a sense of containment. We're bringing this attitude of, of friendliness to the mind and we are working with breath and not making it a problem. If we start thinking a lot, it's just going to be what happens. So some humour in just bringing the mind back to the breath. Every time we do this, we are actually creating new pathways in our nervous system. And you know, the, the teachings that once said through staying with the breath like this, breath by breath, you know, through the different storms of thought, we can come upon an island of peace through the breath. A resource. You can really feel the, the, the way or, or how the breath might impact your body. You could feel the touch in your nostrils or the, the swelling of your chest or your belly. So we're getting very visceral. We're, we're actually getting very sensual, embodied feeling the breath. You might see, is there any possibility of bringing more relaxation to your chest, to your whole belly area? So the whole system is relaxing as we breathe. Just see how you go with this, this exploration. I don't think your breath might feel easy and, and sort of deep or it might feel short. And again, all of this is okay. We really just work and have fidelity to our own experience here. 
breath by breath. So the breath here is like an anchor for the mind. It's touching in with what's actually happening right now. It's the whole body breathing. Just staying with it in this pause together. In time, we're finding a reference point that's deeper than thought a little bit more space in which to look upon the thoughts that move through our experience. We're not so jammed up against them, we're creating more space to see. Awareness of breath, awareness of body. When, when the, the Buddha first taught this practice, he, he would just get people all together and everybody was welcome to these places of inquiry and he'd just, just, just sit down, start to get quiet, start to find the inner spaciousness to be with your breath as a beginning. He'd actually say, sit close to the roots of trees, but we can't always do that, but we can sit wherever. starting to cultivate this good relationship with our own mind, the capacity to be able to, to settle and to rest into this inner resourcefulness. Remember, it can take time, this breathing. Okay, so, so I think it's time to emerge out of this the introduction to a, a calm abiding breath practice. So please just 
just take your time to sort of open your eyes at your own speed. And just to sort of notice how you feel now. No, I think the, the idea is that we want to just to open up the floor to some to, to, to any questions, you know, and really any questions at all are, are welcome. And there's no assumption here that when we practice like this, that we necessarily do feel peaceful. You know, sometimes part of practice is negotiating that which is agitated. So yeah, any questions welcome. So I'll pass it back to you, Nicholas. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so any questions that have arisen uh, as part of the introduction, part of the practice, please post them in the chat. One comment that um, has been coming up across a couple of the sessions, and I guess, um, you know, it probably is particularly relevant in the context sort of as how to deal with particularly strong or intense emotions. Do you have any particular advice for that, Jess, as emotion, strong emotions arise in the context of practice, you know, maybe anger or, you know, extreme frustration or even hatred? Hmm. Um, well, the, I mean, the first thing, I mean, of course, there's, there's a place for meditation and there's a place for conversation you know that there's a place to get support with another human being there's only so much you know in say a lockdown situation when we don't have that support to really work with you know um, by ourselves. so of course my tradition we, we encourage all different modes of sort of inquiry and have great regard for psychotherapy and psychology as, as another answer to human suffering but to answer from more of a my perspective of you know where i work which which is this meditation is that you know what's really clear in the dharma which i think is quite unique is that we are going to suffer you know we have to start with in the, the, the truth of our human predicament you know that we feel all these sorts of feelings you know we feel rage we feel envy we feel joy we feel deep insecurity we feel worry sometimes we feel all of these things in one day you know <laughs> So this is just, if from a Buddhist perspective, this is really okay. And this is what we work with, but it takes time. Like that breath, breath practice, in a sense, sleep, we grow the container to be able to, to hold and abide with those strong emotions, you know? And then we start to, through that, we start to see the nature of them, that they are sometimes not as fixed as we think that they move, you know? But again, that takes time to grow that kind of insight and to do better handle the heat of what we feel. But a breath practice in time will grow our capacity to abide and stay with these strong feelings and see their nature and the way they can move. And that, that can be quite exciting when you kind of sort of feel, wow, that was really strong and I stayed with it. And we'll go more into how to do this over the next six weeks, you know, but I stayed with it and now it's moving. It's not as permanent as I think. Um, that can be quite empowering. Yeah, and I do think in our modern culture, we're quite suspicious of deep emotion, you know, like settle, pedal, take it easy. It's like, I think the Dharma is, is giving us a robustness to handle our own weather skillfully, you know, which we can see the world's not great at. So I think that inquiry is, yeah, is, is a good one. The, it, the Dharma would say, yeah, this is workable, but we need the resources in the ground. I guess a more extreme version of that, um, Wendy has asked if you can do harm by meditating. Um, and and the, I'm not entirely sure about the follow-up, but it says if you do not have great experience. So, um, but perhaps the question was about harm in the context of practice. Yeah. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I don't think sort of, I wouldn't suggest meditation for someone who's, you know, in a, in a highly traumatic state, you know, because that will be answered, I think, with, with a different kind of therapeutic response, which is a lot around relationality and being in conversation and relearning safety with another human being. So if you're trying to work with, it, with, with your mind when it's, 
you know, profoundly under duress on your own, that might not be the best place. But I think these practices and, you know, knowing how to settle yourself with your own breath. I mean, I know people who've been practicing with their breath for a long time and then get into really difficult situations and the breath becomes a friend, you know. <laughs> So, so the breath can be quite trustworthy and sometimes more trustworthy when the, where the mind will want to take us. So coming into relationship with this very basic aspect of our experience and learning, it seems very simple, but I think it's quite profound to be with our own breath. I, I don't think that can cause harm, no. Mm. Um, so Jeff has, has said that uh, they'd like to develop a meditation, daily meditation practice and wants to know how important routine is, you know, so same time, same place every day. Yeah, um, I think when we're beginning, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a militant sort of person, but I can't kid myself and not take and not sort of, I can't underestimate the discipline it's taken me to work with my own mind and what I see with students, you know, I, I think I mentioned that the, the tenacity of habit of the mind, we can't kid ourselves, it's really strong, you know. To, to anchor ourselves in this deeper resource where I think there's so much beauty for us as a human being and, and that really is connected to creativity and free expression. And um, anyway, I, I, so my answer would be yes, I think to begin with, you know, without, yeah, becoming a taskmaster that's gonna wind you up more would be to have some continuity of practice, even if it's a small amount each day and sometimes we think we need to, you know, make the perfect space and get everything really nice. And, and that can be lovely. That can really be supportive. But really, we can practice wherever we are, you know. So 15 minutes each day and just touching in with the breath like this, you know, we can check in next week um, and a bit of a body scan to come into the sensations in your body. Um, I think is very fruitful. Yes. So, yes, to be simple. And, and uh, just a quick follow up on that what are because I like to ask this of people what are your thoughts about sort of how much should people do you know um so how many minutes you know if you're trying to get started what what's a good amount of time you know is it 10 minutes is it 15 minutes is it 30 minutes some people say you know one to five minutes is enough once a day twice a day yeah look I would say to start to start um I mean I think 10 minutes I reckon 10, 15 minutes to begin. You know, you go to a classical kind of retreat, they'll say, okay, hour in the morning, hour in the evening, you know, these Vipassana retreats, um, which we see that have been sometimes a lot of Westerners and modern people's first introduction to kind of practice. That's pretty intense. That's a very monastic tradition. They're kind of, you know, resourcing themselves from there. So I think 10, 15 minutes to start is a really lovely time just to give that mind some pause and to start to have some relationship with a space that's not just defined by where we are not defined by our thinking processes is is a really great thing yeah um and thank you for in general for the time today and um, thank you to the audience as well for joining us yeah um so the center is pleased to host these sessions for the community and the feedback means a lot to us um, so for those who are still on the line, please do take the survey when you have time. Um, and the same session will be occurring next week. And we, of course, have other sessions as well. So please do join us for those. So thank you all. I um, hope you have a good rest of the day and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, lovely to have you all here. I hope that was useful. And you know, just you can implement the breath. You don't have to be practicing formally just through the day if you're getting wound up. Just practice just coming back to the breath in those moments. It can really help. It's sort of like little, little moments where we intervene with a sort of pattern that's winding us up. It's, it's really helpful. Really, it changes the neurology, you know, it's a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah.